The economist Benjamin Grimm once said, the investor's chief problem and even his worst enemy is likely to be himself. This quote captures perfectly that tendency for investors to act irrationally and in ways that are contrary to their own interests. Over the past few decades, an entire academic discipline has sprung up on this topic, behavioral finance, which is the study of the influence of psychology on investor behavior. While we investors would like to think we always carefully weigh our options and sensibly choose the ones that offer the most benefit, the fact that, that we often don't, it turns out that real people aren't even really good at identifying options, let alone choosing the right one. We tend to misinterpret information and miscalculate simple statistical probabilities. And we react to events in emotional and often counterproductive ways. How's my financial health, Doc? Welcome to the Financial Literacy Podcast for Healthcare Professionals where financial security and wealth topics are not a taboo. Welcome back, everybody, to the How Is My Financial Health Doc podcast, and I am your host, Vu Ketran. Today, we're going to talk more about behavioral finance and talk about another behavior that makes the investor their worst enemy. I have a good friend with me today, and his name is Chris Rugel. Chris is a financial advisor and a portfolio manager, and he is an expert at behavioral finance because he sees all the mistakes that his clients make every single day. So I welcome Chris again back on the show to continue our conversation about behavioral finance. Today, we're going to talk about a different bias that I see very commonly among my colleagues as well and that is mindful of fees to the point of being cheap so on one end you've got people who don't understand risk and put too much risk on the other hand you've got people who don't understand risk but also don't want to risk anything and so they don't want to risk anything because they 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 don't want to risk their money so they're being cheap so everything has to be cheap. Right. Um, and so they don't, they, they want to be mindful of cost, but they want to be mindful of cost to the point where they're being cheaped and they don't understand value. And so let's talk a little bit about that. How often do you see that? All the time. In, in my particular case, because I am a professional money manager, I charge fees. And so I'm always pressured to cut my fees down. And that's a business decision that every advisor makes. But it's, it's listen, my industry is very criticized. And I think, in, and oftentimes for good reason. Other times, maybe not so fairly. When I shifted from institutional trading, so when I was on the trading desk, uh, and then I shifted to private client, that's what we call it when we manage individual families, for example. Um, it was fairly common at that time for advi- advisors to use mutual funds that had deferred sales charge. Uh, meaning advisors and salespersons were locking in clients into mutual funds that had five to seven year terms and getting healthy commissions up front. And, and, you know, if, if clients wanted out, they had to pay a penalty. I right like when I shifted, I didn't know anything about DSC. You know, when I started uh, as a, as an advisor, I thought it was a horrible idea. I never used it. I think I might've used it once only because it, I don't even know why I use it, but uh, I never hardly ever used it as a client myself. I would never want to be locked in. Never, not to a particular investment, not to a particular investment company or a specific security for five to seven years. That's an eternity in investments. So that made the industry look bad. Yeah. Things like that. That and clients, sorry, advisors that abuse their clients' trust. So we've all heard stories of that. And of course, if you have an advisor that doesn't know what he's doing, then any fee you pay, whether it be low or high, is not good value. Yeah. If he's not generating value and you're paying for it, that's, that's just throwing your money away. But um, I, think, I think there are capable advisors out there. There are many capable advisors out there, well-meaning advisors, honest ones, that understand the duty to their clients that 
Uh, we understand the fact that we earn a living because our clients have entrusted us with a very important part of their lives, their financial uh, condition and their financial futures, their financial health. Many advisors work hard for their clients. Um, and some of us, <laughs> I'll be honest with you, some of us are kept awake at night at the responsibility that we have on behalf of our clients. So the question for the client is whether the investment advice or the financial planning is a service that is worth paying for. Everybody makes their own decision, right? Uh, like many things in life, as humans, we can learn almost anything. What I do isn't something that cannot be learned by others. It certainly can. You, doctor, have learned to record and publish podcasts, right? Uh, I have used YouTube videos to learn how to do basic maintenance on my car. Yeah. Right? I never took shopping in high school. I had to learn, and I learned it over time. But as humans, as family members, we have limits. We have limits to our time. We have limits to our money. We have limits to our energy. And so we have to choose where to apply that time and energy. Exactly. Some have, with great effectiveness, learned about financial planning. You have. Your podcasts are great. You have a whole series of them on many different topics. Uh, people can do that. You can learn to do it yourself. You can take courses. You could read. It can be done. But that is a choice that you made. Not everyone has that desire. Not everyone has that ability to understand and be adept at these things. So someone might take that time and that effort that you took to learn about these financial issues, and they might learn to something else like cooking or musical instrument or something else that might interest. For those that wish to manage themselves, I have never had any issue with that. Um, if you can do it well, by all means, do it. But there are many, many others who can't. In financial matters, like planning, investing, this doesn't come natural to everyone. The, these people, I have honestly said to them, you need professional help. If you do this, you're going to hurt. If you do this for yourself, you're going to hurt yourself. And whether it be me or someone else, you need someone to manage these issues for you. And like any service, you get what you pay for. So I think it's prudent to look for a good deal. I don't think it's I don't think it's wise to simply accept anybody's pricing without looking at the value that they provide. I think it's prudent to shop around, uh, to compare. But when your only requirement is lower cost, that's a flag because that is a race to the bottom. And it's very possible that you will get a lower quality of service. And I think people should keep that in mind because you know, don't get yourself hosed with fees. Certainly that's not smart, but also don't look for the cheapest cost. If I charge one and a half percent, let's say, and you go with someone that charges half a percent, what are you saving? What are you saving a percent? That's material, that's notable. But if I'm generating several percentage points higher than the gentleman who's, you know, who's charging you half a percent, then are you really saving or did it in fact cost you? Right. So that's where the value should be looked at um, by everyone. Right. If you're going to manage your own portfolio, great. Learn about it. I think people should be educated in the field. But are you going to do better than I can do? That's the question. If you can, by all means, let, uh, we, you know, we'll talk about things. We'll chat. I love talking about this topic. But you are certainly, it's your money. You're certainly within your rights to open up a discount brokerage account and manage all your investments. So but if you cannot be what I can do, then you are in fact costing yourself money. And that's where, you know, being cheap in quotations is not a good idea. Yeah. And so I have no issues with, you know, DIY and doing your own thing, but I think people need to recognize one, their own limitations. Like I recognize I'm an emerge stock. I'm not going to all of a sudden go and operate a brain. Right. So I know where my limitations are. But the other, the other thing that people don't recognize is there's a difference between low cost and value, but there's also something that people don't necessarily look at is opportunity cost. And so if all I'm doing is going low cost and absolute low cost, and that's my only principle in life, well, you're going to miss out on a lot of other things. So people need to understand it's not just cost, it's value value that's important not cost you you did a, a podcast a few weeks ago on ppps for example that's a great example yes. of uh value versus cost 
there is a cost to PPPs. It's a cost that can't be avoided. You have lawyers and actuaries. The value that it generates in tax savings is many times higher than the cost. Now, if someone gets hung up on the cost of a PPP, then you know, you're gonna lose out on the value. Exactly. And this also even happened with a much simpler, um, a much simpler structured RSPs. Uh, I had a friend who absolutely refused to contribute to his RSPs because he said, what's, what's the benefit of an RSP? It's my money. I said, yeah, it always stays your money. It doesn't change being your money. For somehow, somehow he had the idea that it became the government's money. And nothing I could say could convince him otherwise. But he was in a higher tax bracket. He earned six figures. He was probably, his average tax rate was probably in the 40s, which means for every dollar he was making, $4, 40 cents was going to the government. And I'd say, listen, if you just made a $20,000 contribution every year, you'd get an $8,000 refund. And he's like, nope, no, nope, because I wound up paying tax on the road. He could never understand the, the benefit of the value that the account was generating now. And it wasn't even costing him money. Like there's minimal fees to an RSP, minimal. But just that the idea of an RSP for him was a, no, a non-starter. And so the same thing happens when it comes to paying for fees. Right? If you have a good advisor, he's worth the money. Trust me. He will stop you from making bad decisions. He will be, he will be backed by an entire institution that has researchers, that has compliance, that has oversight, that is governed by regulators. Like there is, when you have an advisor, there's 100 people behind it. And in fact, many of the portfolios that are built today are model portfolios not built by the advisor but built by the institution's portfolio team. So you actually have, in many cases, hundreds of years of experience building these portfolios for you. That's the value that you're getting. Now, they're not gonna generate overly exceptional returns because oftentimes these portfolios are very prudent, they're very reasonable, but they will get you where you need to go. And they will help you, you know, a good advisor will help you with tax planning, a good advisor will help you, you know, develop a good investment portfolio. A good advisor will, you know, uh, develop a financial plan for you that you can reevaluate every every so often. Um, a good advisor will be available to you if you have questions. Should I, you know, should I buy a new car? Well, let's take a look at your financial plan. What does it say? Are you capable of doing that? So they're a part of your team that's accessible. That's the value that you're getting. Oftentimes people just look at portfolio returns and say, well, my advisor generated, you know, 10% return. So he's worth it. You know, that's, that's not the entire story. Yep. The value that an advisor or a portfolio manager can provide to you goes well beyond returns. Well, that, that is assuming the advisor does all that and, uh, and, and not, they value. yeah. They Are you value. getting value for your money? I think that's the sentence. Are you getting value? We will have more episodes discussing behavioral finance in future episodes, so please stay tuned. How is My Financial Health Doc podcast is hosted by Dr. Vukit Tran. Dr. Tran is a physician with a special interest in personal financial security and wealth education. Dr. Tran does not render or offer to render personalized investment or tax advice through this financial podcast. The information provided is for informational purposes only and does not constitute financial, tax, investment, or legal advice. Please confer with your advisor, lawyer, or accountant for specific advice.